I think most of us think we understand what a tree is, but I find that when you talk to people, there are some common misconceptions. So this is just a piece of clip art I pulled off the internet, but it is a fairly accurate representation of what a tree looks like. And I think it's important to, to know and to remember the trees are um, complicated organisms. Um, they have multiple parts. It's not just the leaves and the, and the stems we see above ground. They also have this root system. Um, which actually can be much more widespread than the canopy, usually uh, two to five times the size of the canopy. Um, and they are systems and all, of, you know, the roots are in balance with the shoots, the roots take up water and nutrients and share those, or well, they're, those, they're then transported to the above ground portions of the plant and they're used. Photosynthesis happens in the canopy. Uh, so energy is created and then a lot of the energy is used locally. Some of it moves to other parts of the plant. Um, so anyways, they're complicated organisms and you know, oftentimes in landscapes, we just see the trunk and the leaves and that's what we think about. But there's, you know, there's also this root system and, and the relationships between the different parts. My one kind of quibble with this uh, particular drawing of a tree is actually this kind of tap root that it shows. Um, it's not really relevant to anything we're gonna talk about, but it's that kind of a good, you know, uh, trivia sort of um, fact is that in landscape settings, the, almost no trees develop tap roots. It's just not not really a thing. So, but other than that, this is a pretty good drawing of what a what a tree might look like. Um, another thing to think about is, you know, I know we probably have a, a, an audience here from a pretty broad spectrum of um, uh, Colorado, um, but if you live in any of the you know the the Front Range and out of the foothills. You know, this is, you know, there were not trees here <laughs> before before um, European settlers um, showed up and planted a bunch of them. Uh, there was trees along rivers, of course. Um, there's trees in the foothills. But, you know, for the vast majority of the area, you know, this was, this, these were grasslands. And um, so it's tough to be a tree. This is the Pawnee Buttes uh, National Grassland kind of, um, you know, uh, east of Fort Collins. Um, and this is what it looked like before we planted a lot of trees here. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind when you're growing trees, this is a hard place to be a tree. Trees require a little extra care here. Um, and a little more, I guess, like forethought, I, you know, when you plant one um, in terms of species selection and things like that. If you're from another part of the country, you know, this is not the Northeast, this is not the South, this is not the Midwest or the West Coast. Um, growing things here, growing trees here in particular is a bit more of a challenge. So really think of this as your get out of jail free card if you've been free card if you've been struggling, right? It's not your fault. It's just a hard place to grow a tree. Um, so, you know, there, we're gonna go through a bunch of things here and I am gonna focus a little bit on correct watering because it's a big problem, you know, uh, with a lot of plants on the front range, overwatering as much as underwatering as it turns out. But, you know, how to have success with trees here. So one, we're going to pick the right tree for the site. That's where we're going to start. Um, if you're starting new, and some of you I understand will be dealing with mature trees, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, you want to make sure that if you're planting a new tree, you plant it correctly, and then you care for it correctly while it's um, reestablishing its root system, while it's becoming established in the landscape. Those are the two most critical things to having long-term success. Um, we want to, for water use, for water conservation, and for success, we make sure we're using mulches correctly, and we want to water effectively. And I'm going to start, I don't want to, I'm going to start with um, some things to think about when you're picking a tree. And sometimes when I give talks like this, I spend a lot of time talking about species, but we just don't have time today. So I'm just going to tell you some things to consider and then give you some places where you can find some good lists um, of trees for our area. So the first thing that I, and it's kind of a big picture, high-minded thing to think about when, when you're selecting trees is to make, is to give a thought at least to planting um, a diversity of tree species, varieties, and um, uh, and even families, which is even like a bigger classification. Um, by planting a diversity of stuff, you're kind of like taking out an insurance policy against bad things that might happen, like emerald ash borer here in the picture. Um, emerald ash borer is an invasive pest that's been in the state now for a number of years. It's, you know, found, was found in Boulder in, I believe, 2012 and has been spread that sounds like the wrong date. I'm getting that wrong. It's been spreading um, since um, through large portions of the metro um, area. Um, it is a very destructive pest. It will kill pretty much all untreated ash trees in an area where it's established. Um, so if you 
planted nothing but ash trees um, in your site or your neighborhood planted nothing but ash trees or your local park system planted nothing but ash trees, emerald ash borer is a really big bummer for you, right? Because it means you're gonna lose, you'd have to pay a lot, a fair amount of money to have those trees treated for their life, um, for the life of the tree, or you're gonna have to pay a lot of money to remove them. And so on the other hand, if you'd plant a diversity of tree species and emerald and ashes were maybe less than 10% of what you planted, emerald ash borer is still a bummer, but it's not like that, you know, uh, it's not like that uh, kind of landscape uh, changing um, end of the world sort of bummer that it is for um, some landscapes now. And the same thing is true for other things. We have other pests uh, and even like weather events, like we've had these extreme temperature changes, which have affected some species of trees more than others. Um, and so if you had, you know, if all you planted was one species of tree that was, that was just happened to be a species that was less adapted to survive through some of these extreme temperature drops we've had in the fall, um, you were pretty bummed out because those temperature drops probably wiped out your whole landscape. So, you know, look around and, you know, look at what's planted near where you're planting and, and maybe give diversity a thought. Um, here's some examples of other problems we've had. This is an elm, uh, which has been girdled as part of a management program for um, Dutch elm disease, which went through in Colorado, really kind of like the 80s, early 80s, but other parts of the countries in the 70s. There's thousand canker disease of walnuts, uh, et cetera. So think about diversity. Um, something you're probably not going to like to hear is um, you should also think about growth rate and maybe not in the way that you want, <laughs> would like. Um, you know, when I talk to people about uh, trees and they're trying to pick a tree and I ask them what they're looking for, the two things they say most are, uh, one, they want red fall color and two, um, they want a fast growing tree because we're impatient, right? We're an impatient society. Um, human lives are relatively short. We're impatient. We want a big mature tree now. Unfortunately, with trees, uh, growth rate is kind of like the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? Um, fast growing trees, tend to have problems. They tend to be more prone to insect and disease issues. They tend to be more wooded and they're very oftentimes more short-lived. It's not saying that you can't plant a faster growing tree, but know what you're getting into. It's not, it's not gonna be a long, you know, it's not gonna be a tree that's probably there for a uh, hundred years. It's, it's kind of like a, you know, a tree that you plant for yourself and not the next person, which I always think is kind of a bummer because, you know, it's kind of the cool thing about trees, right? It's something you can do that's there for, not only for you and you to enjoy it, but people who come after you. Um, because I can't help myself, you know, the, you know, there's, it's not like, um, like magic or some like weird thing about why fast growing trees are more prone to breakage and disease issues. It's that they grow more quickly. They tend to have thinner cell walls, um, which makes them both more likely to break and more predisposed to insect and disease issues. So, um, I would recommend instead of planting a faster growing tree, planting a tree that's good for the site and taking good care of it. And you'll find you'll get more growth than you would think um, by doing those things. We wanna make sure we're planting trees that are tolerant of our environment. And one big issue we have along the front range is soils. Um, we tend to either have uh, one of two extremes, well, really three extremes, depending where you're at, um, either heavy clay soils, which are tend to be fairly alkaline making them prone to uh, trees growing them somewhat prone to micronutrient deficiencies, depending on the species you're planting. Uh, we also have areas of uh, blow sand, et cetera, that drain very fast and tend to be nutrient intolerant or tend to be um, droughty and infertile. Um, and then of course, if you're in the foothills, you've got gravelly soils, which are similar to sandy soils in terms of their issues, except they're harder to dig at. <laughs> so um, you wanna make sure that the tree that you're picking is tolerant of you know, your soil. And I'll kind of give you some lists of things here in a second to maybe help you with that. Of course, you wanna make sure your tree, the tree is gonna be hardy, um, meaning it can tolerate the uh, extreme, the colds, uh, the winters rather, of the area where you're planting it. Um, this is the USDA zone map. You can see that the front range is, you know, zone, mostly zone five and six, depending where you're at. Um, so, you know, generally if you're, if you're planting trees that are cold hardy to zone four or five, you're pretty good, but there are some problems with this like system. It's based on average, mac, average minimum temperatures, which is fine, I'll, but we do tend to, we do in along the front range get extremes that are kind of way outside the averages sometimes. 
And more than that, we get um, really variable weather here. You know, these ups and downs, we ride that roller coaster of hot to cold. And some trees that might tolerate an extreme cold, like say arborvitae, which, you know, grows natively on parts of this map, like up in, oops, let me go for it, grows natively on parts of this map, like up in Maine and Michigan and places. Arborvitae, you know, can tolerate extreme colds, but here in our winters where we have really dry air and the temperatures fluctuate, it tends to brown out really bad and, and die lots of times in our winters. So this is a good starting spot, you know, the hardiness zone, but it's not the end all be all. Um, a big thing you want to think about is mature size. Don't be this person, right? Pick a, pick a tree that's mature size will fit the space where you're putting it, right? And it's hard, I know, when you buy a tree and it's so cute at the store and small and, you, you know, you maybe plant it three feet from the house and then, you know, it was a blue spruce and it turns out it gets 30 feet, 30 foot wide. And where once you had this, you know, cute little tree by your house, now you have your cute little house inside of a tree. And, you know, where you get like situations like this in the picture where a, a, a shade tree gets planted below power lines and the power company has to come through and clear the lines. And in this situation, it is not the power company that is the villain. It is the person who planted that tree there. The power company is going to keep the lines clear, right? Everyone knew that going in. So anyways, pick a, pick a tree that um, is the right um, mature size for the space where you're planting it. And then finally, I think a big thing that we all need to think about is water needs. Um, we live in a dry place. You know, some years it's drier than others. This year has been pretty dry. This is the March 30th um, drought map of the state. Uh, you can see that none of the state is white, which means that the whole state is in fact in some sort of drought. Most of the front range is in moderate um, to severe drought. Um, Northern Front Range is doing a little better than the Southern Front Range. This uh, There's one more current map than this where we've improved just a little bit from this, but it, it's still the whole state is in drought. And this is nothing new, right? We go through, if you've lived here any period of time, you know, we go through dry periods. Um, you know, probably our changing climate is going to lead to more peaks, valleys, and our moisture levels. Um, so we want to pick something that can tolerate, if you have the choice, that can tolerate uh, dry conditions. On the other hand, if you're planting, if you're, oh, geez. If you're planting, um, sorry, my phone for like one time in my life is ringing at me. Um, it's always on silent besides, you know, apparently today. So um, the other thing you want, I was saying that you want to think about is um, if you're planting a tree in turf, you know, a, a very xeric, a very, dry, a very uh, low water tree might not be the best option because you're probably going to water that turf. So you want to think about, you know, generally things that can tolerate drought. Um, but also not planting things that just, um, uh, not planting super like low water plants, probably in turf, right? Just kind of, you know, you want to, want to think about that. Um, so yeah, and I think here, I've just got a picture. Yeah. I have some previous droughts, right? This was the 2013 drought. It was even worse. 2002 was awful. I don't have a picture of that. And then I just put this in here just to horrify you. This is the Western United States as of, uh, the start of the year. So Anyways, um, water conservation, regardless of what you're doing, if you know, if you live in the West, that's part of that's part of living here. Something we should all be aware of. So, normally, you know, if we were doing a longer talk, this is where I would show you a bunch of trees that I love. But instead, what I'm going to show you is some resources where you can find those trees on your own. So, um, here I've got three things. One, uh, CSU Extension has a lot. If you go to our, our website, just Google CSU Extension Trees and Shrubs, it'll be the first thing that comes up. We have all these different back trees and deciduous trees, large, you know, small trees. Um, Allison O'Connor and I, along with Dr. Uh, Jim, Jim Clett, just put together a, um, a fact sheet on trees for small spaces. So we have all these fact sheets that'll give you lists and we the tree, it'll tell you like what um, criteria those trees, you know, kind of meet. So help you kind of pick one for your site. There are two other resources that after the class, I believe I can get a list of registrants to send this out to you. We have this front range tree recommendation list, which is put together in a partnership between CSU, um, the green industry, Denver Botanic Gardens. And um, I think that's everyone who's involved in that. And it's a great, a great list of um, trees for the front range. It's a little denser. So if you're not just a giant tree nerd, you might wanna, um, it may not be the one for you, but anyways, it's, it's a good, it's a good list. 
And then I will send up this one pager that I've made that is framed as 20 trees to replace ash and front range landscapes. But really it's just a list of trees to consider for front range landscapes. And it's sorted by trees that are easy to find that you can find at most nurseries or big box, even some big box stores. And then some cool trees that you might have to look a little harder to find, but you can find if you're willing to put in the effort. So I will try to send out some of these resources to you after the talk, but um, there's some good, you know, good, good, uh, things to help you get connected with the tree that's good for your site if planting is something you're thinking about doing. I do want to highlight some trees that I would just not plant. I'm going to be native. Um, first, some ones that like, man, I wouldn't put these in most front range landscapes. And uh, I know this picture is not doing a good job of selling not planting Freeman type maples, but I would not plant this tree. The most common Freeman type maples are autumn blaze. Autumn blaze maples are a hybrid between silver maple and red maple, both of which are bottomland species from the East Coast, where the soils are much more acidic, it's much more moist, it's just a different place, right? Um, here along the Front Range, these trees often you will notice them midsummer for the highlighter yellow color they turn because they cannot get iron, probably also zinc, maybe other micronutrients out of our soil. So as beautiful as the red fall color looks in the catalog or in the picture the nursery person shows you, I would not plant this tree along the Front Range. They also have horrible structure, just wouldn't do it unless you know your soil pH is seven or below, like you're in some weird niche situation, I wouldn't mess with the Freeman type maples. Um, the same thing for red oak, um, and it's the same issue. They can't get um, my, some of these micronutrients out of our high pH soils. And on top of that, you know, we're having problems with um, Kermie scale and drippy blight, and they seem to get, it seems to get worse every year. So I just wouldn't plant red oaks either. And then finally, I would not plant in a landscape setting Cottonwoods, willows, or other poplars. That includes aspen in most situations. Um, just in a landscape setting, they get too big. They're too messy. Um, some of them sucker like aspen. Um, they need too much water. They're just, they should be planted near streams or aspen should be planted in the mountains. They're just not well adapted for a small, normal, average landscape setting along the front range. Again, if you've got acreage and you have a lake or a stream, a willow or a cottonwood might be appropriate to go near it. But if you're just in a norm, you know, in a kind of standard, you know, middle of the road yard, too big, too messy, too short lived, um, suckers just don't, I wouldn't do it. Fast growing is what recommends, but again, we already talked about the negatives that come along with that. And then finally, I, the, the list of trees that I, I believe in planting a diversity of species. So the only, right now, the only trees that I just would not plant, common tree that I just would not plant here along the front range that would grow here otherwise are ashes. Um, emerald ash borer is just too big a problem. Um, you know, it's just too destructive of pest. Even though ash look, you know, we're, for a long time, we've called them liable, you know, they've been a reliable tree along here along the front range. I wouldn't be planting ash trees, you're just planting a problem. Okay. So that's kind of uh, phase one here of the talk. Um, I'm gonna do um, maybe 10 minutes, a 10 minute, uh, Allison O'Connor, my colleague, uh, I think she's on and she'll be horrified by how quickly I'm gonna talk about tree planting because it's super important and she is a master of it. Um, but I'm gonna do about 10 minutes on tree planting and then we'll talk a little about, well, then I'll probably pause for questions. So if you've got questions about planting that I don't answer or tree selection, you can get those kind of queued up now, so. So as I said, planting a tree um, and then the care it receives after planting are probably the two most critical steps to having long-term success. Generally, to have success with planting, um, there are some kind of basic things that you need to understand. And that's what's on this slide here. Um, one, the very best time of year to plant a tree, it's kind of right now-ish, right? Sometime plus or minus right now for you know a month ish, depending on our weather, plus minus right now, you know, this time of year, when the weather is cool and the tree will be under less stress. Transplanting a tree is stressful for it. Whether you're planting a containerized plant that just has a very reduced root system because the container restricted its growth, or you're planting a bald and broad plant where they cut off a huge percentage of that tree's root system in the field, um, you know, transplanting is stressful you know, while a tree gets its, and, and, and a tree will be under increased, uh, be more prone to stress until it reestablishes its root system. So we can help them out by planting during cooler times of the year. Um, you can also do fall planting for deciduous trees. 
if you absolutely need to. Um, you can have success, don't get me wrong, doing fall planting. You can have success with summer planting. It's just more stressful for the tree. The one, one, time, one thing I would really avoid is planting evergreens in the fall. It's just, they don't have, you know, they need, then they need to be watered. Um, they're just really prone to, to drought stress in the winter if you plant them in the fall because they're still losing uh, water through their needles. So anyways, early spring is the very best time. Um, and, it, and, and keep in mind, even if you're planting drought tolerant trees or this applies to like shrubs and other things too, until they reestablish their root system, um, nothing is drought tolerant. So if you're planting low water use stuff, you're gonna have to water it till they're established. And our rule of thumb is it takes one year or more per inch of trunk um, diameter, trunk, we call that caliper, trunk diameter to, for a tree to become established. So a one inch tree will take at least one growing season to become established if everything goes right. A two inch tree will take two years and so forth. Um, so kind of a little tip and trick is actually if you start with a smaller plant, it's counterintuitive, but you will get a larger plant faster because that tree will get reestablished more quickly and um, start growing uh, more rapidly, more quickly. And there is several good studies out there that show that starting with smaller plant material five years down the line will yield a larger plant than if you had started with something bigger. So after that, the biggest thing is the science of, uh, I, like to, I like to call it the science of hole digging, right? And there is actually quite a science to how to dig a correct planting hole um, for, a, for a newly planted tree. We're gonna run through the big points here. First of all, you want the root ball sitting on, um, of the newly planted tree sitting at the bottom of the hole on either undug, or if in the case that you didn't plant the hole too deep by accident, have to put back full in there, uh, tamps down compacted soil. You do not want the tree settling is what's going on here. The planting hole, you want to be at least three times the diameter. Uh, the planting hole should be three times in diameter um, the diameter of the root ball. So if you're planting a root ball that's a tree with a 12 inch root ball, you want at least a three foot hole. If you're planting a three foot, <laughs> a three foot um, root ball, you want at least a nine foot hole. Another reason to plant smaller things. We also want that planting hole to be kind of saucer shaped. And this is to direct roots kind of upwards and outwards opposed to encouraging them to circle at the edge of the planting hole. I'll talk more about that in a minute. There are some tips and tricks I'll show you here that you don't actually have to dig this hole out completely. You can like shave it and use the shavings to, that you use to make from flat to saucer as backfill. And that kind of saves you some moving of the soil. I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute. We want the tree to, we, we, want, the, we want the root flare of the tree. So where the, where the shoot system of the tree flares out and become root, flares out like a trumpet and becomes roots. We want that flare an inch or two above grade. And that usually means about two of those, you'll find about two big roots somewhere in the top couple of inches of the root ball of the tree. You may have to take soil off the top of the root ball to expose the flare. It's very common for that flare to get buried by nursery practices. I don't measure all this stuff about three to four inches out from the trunk and just, but if you get the flare above grade, um, you're, you're, you know, an inch or two above grade, you're, you're gonna be better off. So again, you wanna plant it a little high is the take home message there, right? The old saying, plant it low, watch it grow. Turns out that's a lie. <laughs> uh, you wanna plant it a little high. So one or two inches above grade. And you want no soil over, you want no backfill um, or a soil from the extra soil that was in the root ball over the flare. And here's just a picture of that and like what it can lead to. So you can see in this pot here, right? They've been adding soil probably when they potted these up somewhere along the way in the nursery process, when they moved it from a small pot to a bigger pot, they added soil and they buried the root flare. So it seems traumatic, but a planting, you wanna pull off all the extra soil down to the flare and expose it. Because if you don't, you have all these roots growing above the flare and as the trunk of the tree grows out, um, those roots don't go away. They don't straighten their wood. They've got, you know, they've got wood fibers in them. They stay right where they're at. Um, and the trunk of the tree eventually intersects them. And the tree, kind of can, the tree can, and oftentimes does, girdle itself, leading to stress or even death of the tree. And I, I was kind of, it's a really hard thing to explain to people. You come to a tree, um, you know, 10 to 20 years after it's planted and tell, tell people that because it was planted incorrectly, um, a girdling root is now, you know, killing the tree. It's it's tough, but it, it happens. It's kind of a, a epidemic in um, landscape settings. 
So after you dig your hole that's the correct depth and correct width, we're going to backfill. We don't want to backfill over the top of the root ball. We want to cover just to the edge of the root ball and then taper down, um, taper the backfill down to the um, so surrounding soil. You, and I'm going to talk, I think I have a slide about this, but I think actually it makes more sense to say it now. We don't need to be amending the backfill. If you want to throw a shovel or a shovel or two full of compost backfill, that's fine. But we do not want to be adding you know, a bunch of compost to the backfill. One, because that compost will decompose, causing the backfill to settle. Two, because um, it kind of makes the planting hole, I guess, nicer for roots. And really, we want the root systems to leave, the, of the tree to leave the planting hole, right? We, we want it to be like the native soil so that, you know, um, roots are kind of um, encouraged to leave it. Again, don't plant too deep. It can lead to issues where the water that you apply stays in the backfill and does not, um, is not kind of moved into the root ball. Uh, so you'll dig up a tree that died and find the backfill is wet, but the root ball is dry. There's, I don't have time to get into it, but there's like physics of how water moves in soil that's involved in that. So yeah, putting it all together, um, just to summarize, root, sits, root ball sits in undug soil, planting hole three times the width of the tree, of the root ball and saucer shaped, the root flare a little, about an inch or two above grade, and no backfill over the top of the root ball. No need to amend the backfill. That's the basics of it, right? So um, you can modify this. If you're planting in really wet soil, you plant the tree even higher because roots need oxygen and that wet soil is kind of low in oxygen. So by planting it higher, you kind of help the tree out with um, increasing soil oxygen because you improve drainage and blah, blah, blah. Um, if you're planting in really, really compacted clay soil, um, make a bigger planting hole. So you have more, um, uh, loosened aerated soil for roots to grow in. In fact, think about this picture. If, if you're putting in a new landscape and you uh, rototill or aerate all the soil in a yard, you're kind of making that whole yard a giant planting hole in some ways. And actually that in some ways is, is, better, is best for the tree. If you're planting on a hill, you want to plant out of the hill. You want to either change the grade of the hill to plant like this one. You want to add to the, you want to build up the grade like this. You want to half build up and half cut into the hill like this, or cut all the way into the hill like this. And either way, you notice the, the, the story here is you're making a flat spot for the tree to be in. You do not want to plant like this where the tree is like half in and half out of the bad tree. Here's that picture about the labor saving techniques. Like you can shave the last bit of the, um, instead of like digging out the soil at the edge here, you can shave it to make your saucer shape and just use your shavings as backfill. We'll save you some time. So you got your perfect hole dug. The next step is um, going to be, and this is a part which people find traumatic. My spouse found it very traumatic when we were out planting trees at our house. I think she thought it was crazy. Is you want to remove any circling root and the root ball at planting. Um, here's a tree that we planted, right? You can see these big roots that are circling. They hit the edge of the container and they circled. They hit the bottom of the container and they started growing up. Then they reached the surface and the air prune, they start going across. And again, this is another thing that can lead to a tree that looks like this 10, 20 years down the line. So here's a, here's a kind of a case study, right? Look at all these roots that are circling, roots going straight up through the root ball. Um, again, those are never going anywhere. They're going to be there for the life of the tree. So when the tree grows out to them, it can create, it can create problems, especially if they're above a buried flare. Um, here, again, just examples of this is looking down on the root ball. You could see this one that was growing straight up and it got to the surface, it air pruned, and then it was growing across the trunk. That can lead to long-term problems. It seems like a small thing, it's a little root, but again, it's a big deal for the tree. Um, here's one that was going up and circling at the edge of the root ball, just kind of a mess, right? And then here we have the, the actual flare down here. So how do you deal with this? Well, um, the best, the research, the short answer is the research um, recommends what's called you know, shaving or boxing, which essentially means pruning off all those dysfunctional circling roots um, hopefully back to outward facing um, areas of the root that can have more natural root growth. They're using a sawzall in this picture. You can use an old pruning saw like in the top picture there. Um, usually it involves just taking a circular root ball and turning it into a square or an octagon or a hexagon or something depending on its size and just taking off all those roots. Um, again, this is the part that's traumatic. You feel like you're really hurting the tree, but I mean, the research shows it's good. And I personally have planted at this point, I don't know a bunch of trees this way. And um, I can tell you, you're better off in the long run. So shave or box your root ball for better results. Finally, as I said, there's no need to amend the, you know, after you put the tree in the hole, you're gonna backfill, no need to amend the backfill. After you get the um, 
tree in the planting hole, you've backfilled, maybe you've watered to settle the backfill and then add a little more. Then you're going to be um, down to putting some mulch over the backfill. The research shows that that probably mulching over the root ball of the tree is actually not a good idea. Mulching just over the backfill is probably most beneficial. Um, and doesn't uh, mulching over the root ball may lead to some problems. And I don't really have time to get into that. I have real questions about in a place like Colorado, how big those problems are, but anyways. So definitely mulch over the backfill, um, probably not over the root ball. See, I'm gonna tell you a secret. Uh, I, I mulch over the root ball. Allison's judging me right now. Um, anyways. Okay, so let's real quick do some questions and then we'll talk about if there are any that need to be answered. Um, I see there's a lot of things in the chat. Um, so this most recent question, Eric, would be a great one since we're talking about planting. Um, if your soil is only sand, so Eastern Colorado, for example, would you still not amend the soil at all? But I still, okay, yeah. So that, that advice pretty much holds true across soil types, right? Because remember, um, a soil, a tree's root ball is gonna extend two to five times the size of its canopy, right? So the tree that you plant needs to be able to survive in your native soil and native conditions anyways. You're not doing it any favors by making that little area around the tree, you know, like a whole lot better. Like again, throwing in a couple shovelfuls of compost or something that won't hurt and may help, probably not. Um, but in your situation, um, I would say that it's even more important to mulch over the backfill. And if you want to amend, amend the whole uh, whole area where the tree's root systems might be, like if you can, right? You may not be able to, I know, depending on what's already there in the landscape, but like amending the whole yard to get it up to like 5% organic matter or the whole site, that would be good. Um, amending, overly amending the, the planting hole, I still, wouldn't, I still wouldn't recommend, regardless of soil type. On the topic of amendments, what would you say to top dressing with compost before mulching? Okay, I have to be careful because I will spend a long time talking about top dressing with compost and my issues with that in general. Um, generally, I don't, you know, like organic matter is organic matter, right? And if you're going to add it to soil, I would recommend mixing it with the soil. Like if it's something you think you need to do, I would recommend mixing it with the soil um, in this situation, right? Um, <laughs> I guess that kind of covers it. I don't know. I don't know that there's going to be some huge benefit to top dressing with compost, right? When you, when you use, when you use wood mulch, in some ways you kind of are top dressing with a very slowly composting organic matter, right? Um, like throwing a bunch of compost down on the surface, it's probably just going to run away when you water or blow away in the wind. I mean, you might put wood chips over it to hold it down, but I, I just, I don't think there's gonna be a huge benefit. That's the short answer there to doing that. So, um, Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. If you want to talk about it more, email me and we can have a whole conversation about why I'm kind of skeptical about top dressing with compost. Gotcha. And one more before I'll let you move on. And that's uh, uh, Barbara notices that a lot of trees in her neighborhood have been planted on a mound. They have sandy soil in her area. Um, so based on what we've just been covering, that seems like not a good idea in sandy soil or um, is there a factor we're not thinking about? Well, uh, Barbara, I guess the answer there is that it depends like how high of a mound they were planted on. If, you're, if, if they've planted them just, you know, three to five inches high or something, it's probably not going to be a big deal. Now, if they're planting trees like in sandy berms, those are going to drain really fast and you'll probably find those trees need to get watered all the time to avoid stress. Um, but in sandy soils, I'd recommend planting just like the diagram showed, like planting one or two inches above grade, you know, um, the flare one or two inches above grade. If it's three to five, it's probably not the end of the world. But again, if they're planted like on berms or planted like 12 inches out of the soil, yeah, that's probably not a great, a great idea because it's just going to drain really fast. Um, they'll probably have drought problems until they get their roots out of those berms into the lower lying soil. But I don't think there's gonna be done about it now, right? You could use mulch over the more mulch over the root system to um, conserve water, et cetera. But there's probably nothing else to be done about it at this point. 
OK, so we can do more questions at the end. Um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about post post planting care and then I'm going to talk about main main maintaining trees in the last uh, 12, 15 minutes that I got here. So. Um, or, so, yeah, anyways. Um, post planting care, I'm going to get chat out of my way again here and. So you got your tree in the ground. The next most important thing is making sure that you care for it while it reestablishes its root systems, while it reestablishes its root system. This is a little red bud I planted. I would, this, it made me feel old because I have these pictures of me planting it and it's at the office now. I was back in the office for the first time and this tree has actually gotten quite large. I was like, oh no, not only am I getting bald, I'm getting old. Okay, All right. so anyways, um, so as we said, uh, as I mentioned earlier, just to refresh that, you know, how long it takes to establish depends how big it is and then how well it's cared for. The general rule of thumb is it takes one inch of, it takes one year per inch of trunk diameter to establish. So bigger trees take longer to establish. And that's assuming good planting and proper care. If the tree is getting poor planting or you miss a watering afterwards, it could take, um, it could take longer. The very most important thing you can do after a newly planted tree is to water it correctly. Um, and so this is me watering with a bucket, but you could, you know, use a hose or whatever as well. Let's talk about how we go about doing that. Um, or I guess first let's talk about why it's important. So if you underwater the tree, um, so essentially, when, you know, if a tree goes through drought stress, a couple things happen. One, um, roots can just die. Um, and find feeder roots that trees have that absorb water. They come in flushes. And if you kill a flush of fine feeder roots, it may be a while before the tree puts out another flush. So missing even one watering or letting the tree dry out too much just once can actually set the tree back whole growing seasons. So that's why it's important to really be focused on this. Um, watering, you know, water is also used by the tree to photosynthesis. So when you're not watering it, you're, um, you're reducing the amount of energy the tree can make and thus slowing down its establishment. Uh, you don't water it enough, of course, you can lead to, it can lead to failure to establish, which is of course a synonym for death. So you want to keep that root system moist without like flooding the tree and causing water to accumulate at the bottom of the planting hole. Our recommendation, which again, I've never been able to figure out where this comes from, but I think it's pretty good, is we recommend 10 gallons of water per inch of trunk di uh, diameter per watering. So the one inch tree, we recommend watering with 10 gallons of water every time you water. How often you water is going to depend, of course, on weather and precipitation and all that good stuff. This time of year, it might be once a year or once a week, rather. Um, as the weather warms up, it might, you know, be go to two times a week. Or when we get to the 90s and hundreds, it might be three or four times a week. Um, there's no substitute to, uh, for there's no substitute for just going out to the tree and using your finger or a screwdriver and you know probing the root ball and seeing what the moisture is to determine when you need to water. Um, you have to pay attention. Is what I'm trying to say. So check the root ball often, uh, water in the top two to three inches of soil are dry. The root ball should feel like a wrung out sponge, not dripping wet, not bone dry, like a wrung out sponge. You can, use your, you can use your finger. You can use one of these water sensors if you like. You put it in the root ball of the tree and just stick it there. Then water the tree, um, get a little black marker, mark how high it reads when, you, when the tree is wet, wet, wet after you watered it, um, and then kind of watch it. And then you can kind of like when it, you know, when the top two, three inches of soil are dry, you can go, okay, that reads a four. So I know my range is four to like eight or whatever. And I know I water when it gets to like, you know, a five or something. I don't know. But you can kind of, you see what I'm saying? You can kind of self calibrate that water meter. And that, that can be a good, a good way to do it too if you're a really detail oriented person. The other thing about watering is water where the roots are. some of the roots are out in the backfill. And so now it's very important to keep the fill and the root ball moist. And then hopefully, you know, by year three, assuming you're dealing with, a, you know, a one inch or similar tree, 
the roots, the roots are now out into the native soil. And so you're just kind of watering the whole area around the tree. And again, you're assuming this timeline assumes ideal conditions, proper planting. Right, so that's all the backfill in the native soil. So water where the roots are. And this applies to mature trees too. For new trees, um, winter watering is very, you know, can be very important, if we're, especially if we have a dry winter. Um, it's helpful for all newly planted trees to winter water them once a, once a month if we don't get about one inch of precipitation in that one month period, not like one inch of snow, one inch of moisture. So check your local weather station or whatever you like to use to get your, your data. Um, again, new trees will benefit from this, but um, it's, it's, it, it can be critical for evergreens because again, they're losing more, potentially losing more water from their needles all winter if we have warm weather. So they will need more watering to replace that than deciduous trees. Um, but again, all newly planted trees will benefit from some winter watering. And here I'm out just doing it with the bucket on that little red bud back when I had more hair. Um, other watering tips, uh, and this kind of extends beyond uh, planting into maturity, I guess. Um, one, again, no tree is drought tolerant until it's established. Um, good thing to know is that we haven't had real strict drought or watering restrictions for a while now, but if we go into watering restrictions, most municipalities allow trees to be watered regardless of what watering restrictions are in place. And that's because trees are such a huge investment and water managers recognize that. Now, <laughs> to me, this has always been a bit of a contradiction because like a Baroque, which is like, this is like an 80 year old Baroque in Westminster. An 80 year old Baroque that's this big, we said its root system could be two to five times the size of the tree. So its roots are out under all this turf. So how can you reasonably say we can't water the turf, but that we can water the tree? It's kind of a contradiction, right? Maybe you just can't water the turf as often as you would, or I don't know. It's really into the hand or there. It's just one of those things that bugs me. Um, so anyways, you can probably water your trees regardless of drought restrictions, but check with your municipality. Um, and then finally, there is no need to, to buy one of those deep root watering needles that you see out there. If you have one, it's not, you know, I'm not telling you you're a bad person or buying one or whatever. But, the, you know, most of the tree's root system is in the top, especially in the heavy clay soils like we have on so much of the front range, is in the top foot of soil. Because think about where water comes from in nature, right? Generally from the sky, if we're lucky, right? So um, a tree's root system is arranged to capture that moisture. Also, there's a lot more oxygen in the top foot of soil. So that's what, you know, and roots need oxygen to do respiration. And so there'll be more tree roots in that top foot of soil. Um, if you have like a really loamy soil or an improved soil or a sandy soil, you can probably expand that to the top couple feet of soil is where the roots are, but they're still pretty close to the surface. So um, again, that, that needle root water, right? Like if you push that in at three, three feet, there's probably not a lot of roots down there. And then again, think about how big a tree's root system is based on our discussion and where that little needle root water or water. So if you don't have one of those, don't think you have to invest in one. If you do have one and you wanna use it, make sure you move it all around the tree and only stick it in about eight to 12 inches deep. Much better is just to put a sprinkler out under the tree and water from the top down and saturate about 12 inches of soil. Um, a couple other things on watering. Um, so it matters if you're dealing with the clay soil, you're going to water it much less frequently, but with more water because they can hold more water. If you're dealing with the sandy soil, you're going to have to water with smaller amounts of water much more often because they hold less water. Pretty basic thing there. Um, if you want to use drip, um, you know, I think that's a really important thing to talk about because lots of times in new landscapes, um, a landscape will install drip to water the newly planted trees. And when you're dealing with a small tree, Putting one or two of these little drip emitters at the base of the tree might work for a small tree, but as that tree gets bigger and its root system grows, it's similar to that deep root needle in that this little drip emitter is not going to water the whole root system or the, the tree. And the tree will need more water as it grows, so it's going to need more water than that little drip emitter is probably giving it. So if you start with that, that's fine, but as the tr as trees evolve, again, if you're not using a sprinkler and want to use drip, um, you could put this drip tape out. So this is as emitters that drip water in the line, right? So now you're watering the roots a little more uniformly. Here's another version of that, watering the roots more uniformly. I'd recommend this go a little further out even than it does. Or you can buy these micro sprinklers like they use in orchards, which hook into a drip system and are very efficient because they spray water in big droplets very close to the ground, but they water a broader area. So again, they water the whole root system of the, uh, 
they water more of the root system of the tree. Um, so to kind of wrap up our post-planting care discussion, you know, we, had a little, we went a little farther afield there on watering the just planting, but to come back to, you know, post-planting, should we stake a tree to stake or not to stake? Um, so generally speaking, we do not need to be staking young trees as often as we do. Um, unless you live in a windy site um, or it's like a tree in a public area that like you're worried about like, you know, kids hanging on it or people leaning their bikes on it or something like in a park setting. Um, or for some reason, the tree has a really reduced or very small root ball compared to its canopy. So it's like a big sail compared to its anchor. Or for some very large evergreens, we probably don't need to be staking if we plant correctly. And, and a little tip for this that I, I should have maybe mentioned earlier is that when you plant your tree, a thing you can do is right here at the base where my cursor is, you can build a donut of soil just a couple of inches high around the base of the root ball and kind of compact that with your with your boot or your whatever, your hand to make like a little like um, kind of like, I don't know, cup like a rim that holds the base of the root ball. And that will prevent a lot of tipping, especially for reasonably sized trees. So generally you don't need to be staking except in those situations I said, but if you stake a tree, you generally only want the tree staked for one growing season. And that's because, you know, we can think of stakes like a crutch. And so they help hold the tree up and that, that can be true. But if you leave them on there, the tree will not, um, because it's not being moved as much by the wind, it will not develop its natural um, responses to that movement. Like it will not develop as extensive um, of a system. It will not develop as strong of a, um, uh, as much taper. So as much, uh, as, as much diameter growth to its trunk, because again, it's not moving. And so it's not getting that stimulus. And so we'll not just won't do those things. So we don't want to leave them staked for too long or we could long to long-term issues. On top of that, and you've probably all seen this, right? These horror stories that if people, you know, you forget the tree is staked and you leave the stakes on and next thing you know, the stakes are girdling and potentially even killing the tree. Here's a really extreme example. There's that kind of thing you see all the time. The stake was left on too long and the vascular system got compressed behind it. That's stressful for a tree and it can kill a tree. So if you're going to stake, make sure they come off after no more than a year. And again, try not staking. Just use that soil donut at the base of the, at the, base of the root ball in the planting hole. All right, how are we doing time? It's perfect. I left just enough time to talk about mature trees. So as your tree gets older, um, there's a couple of things. I don't have time to do pruning justice in an hour that I'm also talking about other things. But I do wanna briefly mention that as the tree is aging, the most important thing for your tree, like as it goes from a young tree to a middle-aged tree, is to do what's called structural pruning or have an arborist do what's called structural pruning. And essentially the goal of structural pruning is to prevent long-term structural defects in the tree, mainly to encourage the tree to have one dominant leader to the top of the canopy, and have lateral branches that are strongly attached, i.e. they're much smaller than the central leader. They're half the size or less of the central leader. And that the, and the permanent branches, the branches that'll be on the tree forever that aren't gonna be thinned out or removed from the bottom of the tree, the canopy. You also wanna make sure they're well-spaced. So I do a whole talk on pruning where I would talk about that for like an hour or two, <laughs> but that's the basics. Um, dominant trunk to the top of the canopy, uh, uh, small lateral branches, well space, space. If you want to talk about pruning of young trees, you can, you know, shoot me an email. But, you know, that said, you know, assuming the tree makes it to maturity, a um, couple things we want to think about. One, as the tree ages, it's going to need more, as it gets larger, it's going to need more water. Here's a picture of the oval up on campus at CSU, famous, um, mostly uh, American elms planted around the oval, also a few other things. Um, you know, these are large trees, right? Their, their root systems take up almost all the turf. You know, they probably occupy all the turf um, here in the oval, right? The different trees. Um, so, you know, in this case, you know, the sprinklers that, in this case, it's perfect. The sprinklers that are out there in the turf provide the trees enough water. Um, in your yard, um, you know, you just want to think about, you know, think about watering that whole root system. And, it, you know, it could depend on what the landscape around the tree looks like. But, you want to make sure that you're watering the complete root system one way or the other. A big thing about mature trees that's kind of related is, you know, how can we, you know, can we change? I mean, I think about it a lot. Can we change 
you know, from like a really high, you know, change the landscape that's around the trees dramatically without affecting the tree. Like, so say you have a, a yard with turf, right? And you think you're thinking about going to something that's like more like a xeric perennial garden, like here in this picture, which would be much more lower water. Well, if all you have, if you have like these high water use American elms, when you go from this to this, you're probably going to kill those trees or at the very least put them in a stress spiral that, you know, will leave them looking crummy and then maybe eventually dying in the long term. Um, so, you know, just make sure that the plants that you're putting around these mature trees fit with general care and culture of the tree. Um, usually for most of us, a mature tree and the value that brings to the landscape and maybe including an energy savings from shading a house and things like that probably outweighs, you know, that value probably outweighs the value of changing the landscape too much once there's a mature mesic, i.e. water loving tree in sight. And I guess this is all a big rambly way of me saying, if you have big mature trees that you like, don't try to go xeric underneath them, or at least don't try to go too xeric underneath them or you'll end up affecting the tree. One thing you can do to help the help of mature tree is to give it an area underneath it, which is just for the tree's roots. And this is not actually the best picture of a mulching, but it's just the one I have. Um, and we do that by removing the grass one way or the other and replacing it with um, like an organic mulch like wood chips. Um, that area, uh, not only do the wood, is that area just free of competing plants for the tree, to, you know, so it's all the water and nutrients in there for the tree. But on top of all that, um, wood mulch does a lot of things to improve soil conditions and lead to more root growth underneath it. It keeps the soil from having peaks and valleys of temperatures and peaks and valleys of moisture at least the valleys of moisture. It helps like kind of conserve soil moisture. Um, so it keeps weeds out if it's three to four inches, which we, which we, we what we recommend. And if, in like in a perfect world um, where you care about nothing but tree health, probably like, you know, getting that, that, that tree ring out, you know, further away from the tree trunk, even in this picture, like out towards the drip line of the tree would be ideal. Now we don't live in ideal worlds and most of us don't want our whole yard just to be a empty wood, <laughs> empty wood mulch bed underneath our tree for the tree's health sake. But um, bigger is better with these tree rings. Um, and then finally for your mature trees. So these are, you know, all that structural stuff I talked about briefly a second ago kind of goes out the window for mature trees because they already have their major structure formed. For mature trees, we're, we're past preventing long-term structural defects. We're down to like mitigating, we're down to dealing with them, we're doing triage um, if the tree doesn't already have good structure. So the two types of pruning that mature trees most commonly um, have done to them are uh, cleaning and thinning. Cleaning is the one that most mature trees probably actually need. It's just removing dead, broken branches, diseased branches, removing branches that have obvious structural defects like included bark. Um, it's removing or thinning water sprouts, uh, removing suckers, all that stuff, right? It's just kind of maintenance stuff. Um, not very stressful in the tree, probably not much live wood is coming out of the tree with a cleaning because mature trees are not super tolerant of heavy pruning, it turns out. The other type of um, pruning that mature trees oftentimes have done to them and they may or may not need is thinning. Thinning is essentially, uh, when it's done correctly, what thinning is removing branches at the edge of the canopy to increase air and air movement through the canopy and light penetration into the canopy. And the idea there is you reduce wind loading, you reduce probably snow loading, you reduce disease issues by allowing more circulation through the canopy. Um, you can actually hypothetically improve the taper, so the diameter growth of interior branches, making them stronger because you let more light in the interior. So the interior leaves get, you know, collect more light, do more photosynthesis, and then have more energy to um, create more energy to allow those branches to grow in diameter. And all that sounds good. But there's two problems with thinning. One, right after it's done, immediately what starts happening is the canopy starts closing again. So you have to thin consistently. And having an arborist with the equipment needed to get up in a tree and do this sort of pruning is expensive. So, you know, the benefits are short-lived unless you're doing it all the time. That's one problem with it. The other problem with it is that it's oftentimes done incorrectly. And that's what's going on in this picture from Dr. Gilman's textbook. So we have uh, the same tree, right? Um, it's just with leaves and without leaves. And we have proper thinning, which kind of makes a mosaic of the canopy, right? Allows more water, light. Um, the, the edge is thin much more than the interior. Um, 
So that allows more light into the canopy, does good things, right? That's what it looks like both with and without branches. This is what oftentimes happens by arborists who are old school or just not trained. And that's that they, they remove almost all the interior branches. Now this is like a, this is not, they wouldn't like make it just the poof ball necessarily. This would be, this is just a, a cross section of the tree. There's still like leaves that we can't see to the front and back of the picture, but they remove a lot of the interior branches and don't fit enough at the exterior. And this leads to decrease in taper, uh, more prone to failure and distress. So what I'm saying is that thinning is, is hard to technically execute. And they, even a lot of arborists who are well-meaning are not trained in modern thinning techniques, although that's kind of changing. So, you know, I would recommend if you're going to prune a mature tree, first of all, talk to an arborist. You don't want just to go out and allow her and do this. It's a bad idea. I mean, you may have noticed this in America, but healthcare here is expensive. It is not worth the trip to the hospital to save the money that it would cost you um, just to hire an arborist, right? So, um, you know, uh, one, call an arborist to do it. And two, you know, if you're having a mature tree pruned, if the tree has good structure and doesn't have a lot of dead wood, you probably don't need to do anything with it. Um, but if there's a lot of dead wood, broken branches, and the structure seems like, you know, it's got a lot of large lateral branches, like, or you're losing branches already, um, you know, you want to talk to them about probably more about cleaning. And thinning is kind of a thing you want to, you know, it's a little bit harder to, you want to talk to an arborist about that and see what they think, because it's a little bit harder to determine if a tree actually needs thinning. It probably only needs thinning if it's one at an increased risk of failure due to the like, presence of decay or really bad structure, or it's on a really windy site. So that's my very short version of pruning and it's one o'clock. So I'm out of time. Um, don't do this. <laughs> don't have your trees rounded over or lion's tail. These are old school things arborists used to do. Both are very bad for a tree's health. Um, both are very bad for a tree's health. So don't do it. Um, bottom line, if you're going to get mature tree prone to talk to a certified arborist, the Rocky Mountain chapter of the International Society of Arboriculture has a website that'll help you get an arborist or talk to your city forester. They probably keep a list of arborists that are licensed and insured, um, who are, uh, licensed to work in the city and insured. So, all right. I was one minute long. Um, but here are some other resources you might look at. Um, plant Select is a great place to go for plants for the front range. We have the cohorts blog. Um, you can do internet searches for these things to find planting steps or trees. And again, my phone number is here at the bottom. So with that, I will answer any, I will stay and answer any questions that you have for the next 10-ish minutes or so. If there are any questions. Um, and I think thanks for coming.